Hi, and welcome to the Flute Talk Podcast, where we talk about all things flute and answer your questions live on YouTube. If you want to help us out, be sure to subscribe to our channel and add us to your podcast feed over on iTunes or Google Play. We all need sheet music, and we're proud to announce that we're working with Sheet Music Plus, home of the world's largest sheet music selection, and is a proud sponsor of the Flute Channel. Finally, if you're looking into buying a new flute, be sure to check out the Flute Center of New York at flutesforsale.com. With our code TFC at checkout, you'll be able to try three flutes or piccolos for 10 days, and whichever instrument you choose, you get an extended 18th month warranty on it. So be sure at checkout to put in the special code TFC at flutesforsale.com. Now on with the show. Hey everybody, welcome to the Flute Talk Podcast. I'm Nick. And I'm Emily. Hi Emily. Hi Nicola. How's it going? Very well. Good. So, uh, yeah, so we have done a bunch of stuff. We had some just practicing stuff and the flute festival is coming up this week so that's kind of exciting yeah flute festival time if you're wednesday in the montreal friday. Yeah. yeah wednesday to friday this uh in montreal so if you're uh in the area we still have sp- we, we still, still have, have sp- uh, yeah there's space available yeah, you're more so welcome you can come out in one day you can come for all three days you can come just for the concert uh yeah if you do yeah. montrealflutefestival.com you'll find all the information there. there the concert is on also friday on friday evening yep and uh you can also only come for the concert yeah and meet us and yeah totally listen. a lot of fun i know a lot it's of people in the i know luke is going to come in from the chat and stuff like that and a bunch of other people too and we have people coming for three days which is great and uh be sure to let us know if everything's going well with the stream um also how it sounds and stuff just let everybody know um what else was there, there was something else but i can't remember it's okay but we have a great question today's all about long tones because this week i read a comment that was really good and we're gonna sh- i want to share that with you and share that with the with the, everyone else um the person, I forget their name, but I will say that later. Uh, I didn't write it down, but that's okay. I have a question. How do we as flute players decipher between talent and hard work? I'm asking mainly in regards to tone. According to my brain, if I practice technique at a slow level and speed it up, I can get the technique. However, for this tone, this is not the case. Or however, for tone, this is not the case. For tone, everyone says to do long tones. However, everyone who does these long tones, at least my colleagues, already have a neutral and often good slash great tone quality. Uh, When uh, they do long tones, it makes them sound better. However, when I do long tones, nothing really happens. In fact, my tone is completely unrelated to practicing. I find that my tone responds mostly to the humidity of the room that I play in rather than how much I practice. I know of two other colleagues who have the same dilemma. They practice, but their tone, like mine, is perpetually subpar uh, not trying to be mean or harsh uh, on them or myself. I'm trying to make, trying to get a point across. While some of my other colleagues uh, may practice a lot or never practice, yet have great tone. Uh, I uh, might note that these colleagues don't seem to have superior knowledge or insight regarding the flute. Does any of this resonate? Can flute tone be taught to someone who struggles greatly with it after years of playing? How exactly does tone occur? Well, there's yeah. a lot in there. There's a lot. There's but a yes, lot. it can be taught. Yeah, they can. It can be yeah. taught. And another thing is um, long tones, I think, are a tool Yeah. to work on your tone. It's an exercise. You do the exercise and then um, you should get a better tone. Mm. Let's say uh, we, okay, I'm not a bodybuilder, but let's say you're trying to um, get in better shape and you go to the gym, but when you do some of the exercises, you have a bit very bad posture while doing it. Then you'll hurt yourself. Mm -hmm, You won't get in better shape. You'll get in worse shape. Mm -hmm. An exercise, it's, uh, it's, it's just an exercise. Right. You can also not do long tones and and get a good tone mm. because maybe you get your good tone from other exercises you do or the way you practice you maybe find other ex- yeah maybe find that. exercises that do help your tone maybe you do those instead what i think is if your tone is not is not uh, the way you want it to be is not good or whatever you want to say mm-hmm. however you want to say it it's probably not an exercise, mm. 
that's gonna help you as much as uh, figuring out what's keeping your sound from being good like are you pushing your lips forward are you blowing in a constant manner are you opening the throat or closing the throat are you so nervous on some notes that everything closes mm. I exactly. would I would say instead of hmm. focusing on which exercise you can keep long tones and look in the mirror sure hmm. and check what you're doing maybe mm. find find your best note and see what you're doing and then try to find your you know look at it a bit like a researcher and i think he th this person has a researcher mind a little bit because it's all like sure. oh, this so person sounds like, and it, that's what it like, sounds like a scientific mind mm -hmm. you know but now look inwards because uh, the the research has been a lot about others and comparing the outside but maybe now it has to be more about himself or her herself you mm -hmm. know being like okay this note sound when i sound good it's probably not the humidity of the room you know it's probably not those types of things mm -hmm. trying to figure out what's going on there how does it feel in your body and reproducing that what did when it doesn't sound good i even had a i heard of a teacher he, he was a trombone teacher but i thought it was a very good idea his students told me that when they had a bad sound sometimes he would say make it worse and figure out what you just did to make it even worse and now do the opposite of that you know mm -hmm. it's about trying to figure it out you can do long tones you can practice badly and just make things worse it's mm. not just about practicing it's about uh, being aware mm. the awareness factor is key for sure like I, yeah, I yeah. Agree. and a good teacher is supposed to help you mm -hmm. not by just saying how to get a good tone but how you mm -hmm. help you find your way because mm -hmm. it's all different yeah. I don't play exactly like you because I have a the, my teeth are not exactly the same and our mouths and our throats and our faces nothing is and in fact the same so except us being human <laughs> there's like really yeah there's um big lines that everyone kind of follows but then there's little differences mm -hmm. and then there's people that do it completely differently and wow it's amazing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i really like the make it worse thing like you make it worse it's sort of like a reset for your brain and then you go back and then your brain reacclimates to that's how i would use it as you know it's like a reset then you go right back in to try again and then somehow your brain is now figuring out another way to approach the new sound that you have in your head and i think also it makes it's probably helpful to feel less nervous about it oh it has to be beautiful it has to be beautiful no look you can oh, make yeah. it ugly as well also it's just you know yeah and like long tones it's just are, practicing yeah. you just it's and also long tones are so general like the long tones that we all know about that we all can most likely understand when we say long tones uh that style is not even a style to anything related to it like it could be you could do long tones in the baroque style you can do like how can what do you mean you know i mean like it's the sound of it the sound of it itself like what long does long tones, tones uh baroque style what do you mean by oh that? Uh, maybe i'm uh, a little talking out there somewhere but it's uh I'm just saying long, long tones only take care of one element, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's just, it's just a moment for you to focus on your sound only. Right. But then let's say, okay, let's say you structure your practice um, like this. You do long tones and then you do scales and technical exercises. Sure, okay. sure. Let's say okay. your tone is good in the long tones and you really focus on some elements to keep your sound good mm. but then when you start doing your scales you completely forget about it you know it's it's really about being aware all the time yeah but also as i think what you meant is there's different exercises it's not just yeah i knew somebody who yeah exactly i knew somebody who said yeah. that you know make make uh, your pieces tone exercises you know as well yeah. and i think like really learning different styles because i think we get a little restricted when we think long tones are supposed to help us with all other styles of music when to me i think it's no of course not yeah, of course not uh, people think that <laughs> yeah that's what, oh yeah people no, think it's just, people think it's, it's a remedy a lot of people I, even i used to like it was the remedy to fix what was wrong with your tone because tone was connected to so much 
It was, yeah. I knew a lot of people that thought like that. It's not. I plus, know it's not. I know. Plus, I know it's usually not. when you do long tones, yeah. you do you do um, very small intervals. You do semitones or. But when you play, you don't only play small intervals. I know. So if I you know. only practice that, it's very em- it's not enough. Mm. I think harmonics and then I, I do uh, I do a lot of uh, octaves like the dee da dee dee da dee dee da dee dee those types yeah. of things. And you can also check in the book uh, De La Sonorité by Moïse. Mm-hmm. I'll try to say it more with an English accent. De La Sonorité by Moïse. Um, Marcel Moïse. There's a lot of good exercises there for sound. It doesn't have to be yeah. always the same thing. But maybe also our well, video about how to get rid of the yeah. air in your sound might, might, might help uh, as well too, be helpful. Because it's something. sometimes it's those elements that are disrupting the tone. And that and it just, yeah, it just sounds like that to me that it's a bit... Uh, overthought like we're over we're over analyzing or putting too much on that long tones are this very very important thing and maybe if it's even a you know I think there's more things like trying to get rid of the air in your sound might be the thing that might help a lot you know or trying other well, exercises that, what I mean is uh, it's the same it's, oh, a, I know it's the same goal long tones in that video like it's just we titled yes, it that way exactly but it's the way. same goal but Which is, yeah. the thing is there's different exercises in that video mm-hmm. than long tones mm-hmm. that are more efficient than long tones mm-hmm. i think and you know it's uh i think we also create uh superstitions of course with that's the what flute yeah. like some some of those superstitions are oh you have to warm up before you play i think what is that? I'm a superstition. It's it's a philosophy, my dear. That's a, I think a lot of people. That's their philosophy. You came and you have to pra- You have to warm up before you play. You know. No, I think yeah. it's a superstition. I'm yeah, sorry. yeah, sure. I don't For think it's a, They might think it's a philosophy. Yeah, I think cool. it's a superstition. Sure. I think it's philosophy. But yeah, totally. Because the philosophy, it's it's a way of thinking, and it's it's a way of trying to figure out what the truth is. There's no truth and you have to, uh, yeah. it's just a superstition. It's like thinking that, uh, you know, it's like any other superstition. Black cats will um, make you uh, have uh, bad uh, bad things happen to you. It's just a super, I don't think you have to, and I don't think you have to all the time. Maybe if you didn't practice for a while, maybe if you feel some of, the elements in your sound are not mm. the way you want them. You can use some exercises, but do you have to before you start playing? Every time That's you start question. playing, I think we put because what supersti- superstitions do is that they they make us feel very uneasy when we don't do those things. Mm. So if you don't have time to do it, then. Um, Yeah, if you don't have time to do it, then you'll be super nervous that you didn't do it. And it's just you program yourself to think that it's important. That not not only is it important, it's necessary or else you'll fail miserably, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, another exercise, uh, Marie was saying the Moise 24 little etudes. Those are, in fact, I think even better than the long tone thing in the listenority, that other book, that 24, the one that's very easy, it says, but really it's actually quite difficult I learned that years after to the sonority I found out that that book existed and there was a class that went through the whole entire 24 of them and it, it was like five hours long like it was so interesting to see how you can make those different phrases in different styles and in different ways to communicate those it was super interesting that that book is great so Maria that's good that you're learning it it's a very interesting book and also you can make yourself um you know, if you say, oh, I'm going to do long tones until my sound gets good. No, just, just try to build everything at, at, you know, build everything. Yeah, but that and way, what the way people th- say like that, that's what I'm saying, is that they treat it like it's this, yeah, if I take enough doses, I'm finally going to get better. You yeah, know? no, and that's but why not, I agree with that. you that doing studies and that's other things is, yeah. is efficient because you have to play and not just uh, focus on one thing and stop yourself from progressing mm-hmm. until that gets better totally. you have to mm-hmm. let it go a little bit totally so if you guys have any questions about tone we can you know talk more about it during the podcast today uh we also have questions in the chat already uh let us know uh what you guys think as well uh sam green wants to know uh i would like uh, to ask for some help with high e it just seems so unstable 
more uh, so than notes higher than that, I think that it might just be that and I need to practice solely that note more uh, to develop my embouchure, but any outside help useful, uh, any, any outside, any help would be useful. Yeah, because the E is very difficult because that's why there's even a facilitator inside of it. High E, uh, when Not you make the flute. Not all the flutes have it, huh? No, all flutes have that problem. All flutes have that problem with no, high E. No, but some, some flutes have it a little. Yeah, the facilitators, or they have a split E, which vents the hole and closes the hole so it can stabilize the E. Because naturally, when the flute is built, the E was always one of those ultra stubble notes. Because it's a note harmonic it. fingering. Yeah. Really so some people put yeah. So some people put donuts. There's little metal donuts that partially facilitate the hole. So it's like a little disc that they solder in there. You can get that available as an option. Um, so you go most to your flute technician and yeah. you ask for a donut for yeah, your donuts, for yeah, your E and yeah. they'll know what it they'll is. They'll know what it is. Yeah, and it's usually a pretty cheap uh, job if you're not going to be selling your flute and buying a new one anytime soon. Most student flutes don't have that. Um, most student flutes don't have split E's. They have offset G's, but the offset G doesn't necessarily will have that little prong there that facilitates the um, the E. So yeah, split E, that's why it's like a split E mechanism. When you have a split E, that helps the E be better. Because without it, like a lot of student flutes, it sounds pretty bad. It's very unstable. Yeah, because it's a loose harmonic fingering. So it's not just you. <laughs> the flute is imperfect. Imperf the flute is not perfect. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, you can do that. There's a donut. There's also but it's, conversions. But it's, it's like another how I teach it to my students. Because even when you have that that donut, it's still a bit harder. And then you have the oh, F sharp it's also. A, that's that's a fragile one. It definitely helps. Though. I have a student who has more difficulty with the F sharp than the E. You know, it, it depends. But even if you take care of the E, the donut will not take care of your F sharp. Mm -hmm. But how I teach it is I try to say that it's as if you had, uh, you know, you're in an elevator and you have different levels on your, so you have like first level, second level, third level for your sound, you know, for your, for your different octaves, but the E and F sharp, it's like they're on their own level. There, it's another. Mm. So you have to blow it a bit differently. Put it a put a little bit more into it. Mm. I'd like to reread that because there was a lot of stuff. I want to make sure we answered it. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, so while she does that, we just want everybody know that we also have our Patreon. We just got a new patron today, and that helps us out too. Patreon.com slash the flute channel. There you can help us out by uh, donating uh, as little as a dollar a month to help us make more videos and produce more. And it's totally uh, optional, but it really does help us out. And also the Flute Festival, I said, uh, as we said, uh, the Montreal Flute Festival is going to be starting on Wednesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday here in Montreal. So if you guys are interested, if you're in the area, uh, definitely uh, check out that information and see if you want to sign up and join in our classes and uh, play some flute, listen to some flute, and talk to us and answer any questions that you have. And what else is there? We have a bunch of other stuff. Uh, no, I think that's it. There's other stuff, but yeah. Is there other questions? Many though? questions, many okay, questions. Yeah. Because we kind of did, just how does tone occur, we didn't really say. We have a, we have a video that's called Basic Embouchure. Yeah, Basic and Embouchure for the Flute, I think, yeah. Yeah, I think there you'll find the answer um, you know, it's like it's a whistling. You have a little bit of air going on both ways of the of the lip plate, and um, yeah, I think you should watch that video. Mm. Might help, and then maybe if you have more questions, come back and ask mm -hmm. them. Yeah, a lot. Like we always say, a lot of air blowing into the flute does help with tone. It does clear things up. It's usually when there's a lot, when there's not enough energy that you introduce a lot of like this noise and all these things that you, you don't like. And the thing is, you don't have any, you don't have any resistance in the embouchure with the flute. It's not like on the trumpet or no. any other instrument, the, there's resistance. We don't, it's an open embouchure. And so if you don't put resistance with your abdominals by really pushing with, with strength, mm. like with some, um, yeah, resistance kind of thing. Mm. Then people tend to put resistance elsewhere in their bodies. 
they tend to put resistance in the throat by closing the throat or close you know closing the hole or so y mm -hmm. you have to put the resistance in the right spot which is the the belly really mm. i think that's what i notice so um, yes blowing a, yeah, lot. Blowing a lot yeah, yeah. Silver Flute, he wants to know, he or she wants to know, uh, how do you double tongue the high notes without tonguing very hard? I always struggle with this because we have to play our chromatic scales at 120 and 16th notes, at 120 and 16th notes, and we tongue it for district band. Okay, well, if you think it's too, um, he said like too harsh or too... Without uh, tonguing very hard. How can you make it sound light? Because they're tiny. Well, instead of doing taka, you can do daga. So that's so that's daga instead of taka. Yeah, you can try that. And it's it's like it's a bit closer in the mouth as well. Like taka, it's really front and back, and daga gets more in the middle. Both of both of them, daga 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 daga. It's more like you're brushing, you know. Mm -hmm. You're not as much going. Uh, I don't know how to say, but you're not punching it. You're just brushing it. Da -ga -da -ga -da -ga -da -ga -da -ga -da. Mm. Mm. Okay. So hopefully that helps. Yeah. We have a double tonguing. And you have to make sure you continue to. Yeah, we have a double tonguing video, I think, too, yeah. and a triple tonguing video. And you have to make sure yeah. you uh, you continue to use those abdominals to push the air. Yeah. Robert Cowles, he wants to know. Can you explain to me the difference between dark and bright tones? What is meant by this or these? What, are, what okay. is meant by these? Usually when people say dark, they mean uh, there's more um, um, edge to the sound. Like it's more um, more timber and bright is, uh, I can give an example maybe. Cool. Okay, let's be careful here. Take your time. There's Wow, you do that? Yeah, I think, yeah, it's, it's about, it's similar to that for sure. There's a, you know, style helps with in this, in, on what you're playing and also they mm -hmm. all play contributing things. But yeah, there's a general dark and bright. Change the color there. Did you hear it? I'm, I, am I the only one who heard it? I don't know. <laughs> okay, I'll do it again. So I'll I'll do something a bit more. Um, maybe kidding. I should play. I'm just kidding. This way. You're okay the way you are. Okay. So the first one. You were kidding. So you knew what I was doing. You let's heard do it again. Let's do it again. Okay. Yeah. Let's do it again. So. difference sure yeah so which one was darker uh, it depends on my taste first one was darker I yeah thought. first one was darker mm -hmm. it's just more timber like yeah and the second one more oh mm -hmm. it's easier if you change register <laughs> but you know mm -hmm. you kind of feel yeah and plus we're kind of cursed with an instrument that always sounds bright so you know we're known as a chirpy 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 type yeah, of yeah, thing all the time you know so even in <laughs> Um, I feel we have to work always a bit harder to be darker. Yeah. You know, but it's mm -hmm. also sometimes in the energy you put in and the That's way what it you is. That's what I'm saying. That's what's yeah. the best part of what tone color is, is the energy you put into it. It's, you know, timbre and edge, that's equal. The other side of that equal sign is energy <laughs> and the amount of energy. It's, it's physics, right? You put in that uh, amount of energy, you get that type of sound, you know? Yeah, but it's also how where you direct the air. That's, on the that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. It's not just it. more energy. It's where you... Energy where you plus where you put it, plus it's all these yeah, little yeah. equations in order to get those types of things. I knew a person who thought of it like that. He said, I have to mix these, but he thought of it in colors. So he's like, I have to mix gray and black to make this type of edge, or I need to max, uh, mix mix uh, green and blue to make something else. Like he really, and it worked for him. It was crazy. It worked very well. And uh, I know a lot of people that thought it very systematically. It's very an interesting, interesting approach. Well, you have to find your own way of uh, 
No one can teach you that. You have to teach it yourself. Like yeah, which images are going to help you? Yeah, what bridges of connections you I need to make? I used to think there? about because uh, I used to think about eating. You know, I'm going to make this one like mm. ice cream, and that I'm going to make so this one like yeah, spicy. So I, so there gonna, you go. You know, uh, you can you can f find any like sometimes I imagine movements. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I, you know, you can use. Mm different mm -hmm. I think even students can senses yeah, yeah, totally. different senses to inspire mm -hmm. yourself mm -hmm. it doesn't only have music doesn't have to be only mm -hmm. with your ears you know yeah. you can you can use colors yeah. a lot of people use colors mm -hmm. that are more visual mm -hmm. I'm not that visual so sometimes I use more like tastes and mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. movements mm -hmm. and stuff mm -hmm. like that depends you know mm -hmm. can use emotions yeah and beginners can do this too it's not oh, yeah. like it's not an advanced technique at all it's it's a way it's to really have not, fun you know? playing music yeah it's a way to fun have playing music and exploring all the weird all the it could be very weird very cool very typical sounds you know so many different types of ways it's not and an advanced sometimes thing. it's not just going to be in your sound but it's gonna it's gonna direct your whole musicality mm -hmm. because you can't if you try to um control every little aspect of flute playing separately your brain's gonna break Oh yeah. But when you use a full image or a story or a, then you align your body to do all those things without being completely mm -hmm. aware of what's happening. Mm -hmm. I remember I, I was um, studying in, in a pre-university level. I had a problem with a movement. I don't know, a slow movement, not that like very easy technically but with the sound the colors I couldn't find it and we were trying to figure out something technical to fix it my teacher and I you know maybe if you blow more here maybe if you blow more like this then checking the mirror and then at one point she said you know what sometimes it's not the f it's not the the physical aspect that's gonna cure it it's the imagination mm -hmm. and then everything will float Let's figure, how, what do you think of that piece? What does it make you think of? You know it was written during the war, uh, blah, blah, blah. And we started talking about it and then I played it and I was in that inspi inspired mood and it was all taken care of. Mm. Mm. So sometimes we're too technical and we forget that our bodies can do so much without controlling it. If you just let it do its thing, it's gonna do it. Mm -hmm. oh, so there we go. Yeah. Uh, Gabriel Mas Mesquita. Oh, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. I'm from Brazil and I am a saxophone player. Does long tones work good to get change to, to get changing the embouchure? Like, does it help to change the embouchure? Because you know, I have to switch back and forth. Like, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Because it will place your sound. You know, but it's all about your. You have to know what sound you want before you start your long tones. And then you do your long tones trying to go to that sound that you want. Yeah, you're trying to recall the, the most... Because just doing to yeah. fit without... You know, it's yeah. the whole thing of... You have to know what you want. Yeah. You hear the sound, you try to get that sound, and you're only focused on that, so it's yeah. going to help. Yeah, it's going to help make a preset embouchure for yourself so you have a different embouchure for different instruments. Yeah. Because the body can can change, the body can do that. You know, you can mm -hmm. you can tell your ears and your brain to move your lips the specific way that you train it to. So yeah. Uh, what else is here? There's a good one here. Um, oh, how different is the piccolo from the flute? Kitty pause one seven zero. <laughs> well, the piccolo is a, is a smaller instrument mm -hmm. with a smaller embouchure. So you have to uh, be very focused, like send the air on, on that very small hole um, and have a good air pressure because if you stop supporting, the sound will not be so good right away. Mm -hmm. And we also have a video about starting on the piccolo, I think. Don't mm -hmm. we? Yeah, we do. I think we do. Yeah. Yeah. So, but in short, it's, it's, it's that it's pretty easy. I think it's the same fingerings, it's the same everything, just smaller. So you have to think everything a bit smaller. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you can do all the same exercises you would do with your flute, with your piccolo. You right. can do long tones to try to yeah. find your find your tone, but yeah, long tones it's it's not um it's 
it's really uh, you have to be aware all the time when you do it if you just go fee, 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 it's mm. <laughs> you know it's about listening and how can i get something better and that's why i i think practicing those in front of a mirror can be good sometimes or but sometimes also closing your eyes and just trying to feel how you wow. you, know, you, mm. you can you can move mm. it around you don't have to always do it the same way yeah uh maria says she wishes could be at our festival she's going to be going to london and she's going to hear uh stefan hokelson he's going to be performing there i kind of know who he is <laughs> that's cool well, you can come anytime next year we're going to do it four days and it's going to be uh, really awesome uh tarius wants to know what are the downsides if any sorry of playing first and second octave e without the pinky pressing down on the d sharp key First and second, there's no uh, there's no, so no advantage of not putting no, it, and the like, third register. But playing E, a lot of people, and maybe she's maybe the person's uh, saying you no, know, like E, yeah, I think maybe it's D that has a little bit of a problem when you cover D in the low register and you don't press it down. No, what is it? It becomes oh, E flat. It becomes E flat. No, there's another one. There's the reason. Oh, I don't remember which notes they are. What I know yeah. is that. When we answered that person with the high E, we forgot to say that if you remove your pinky on the third octave E, it's easier. To For some flutes, it stabilizes it. Some it flutes, it makes it worse. It. Yeah. But, well, most yeah. flutes I've ever tried, it, it worked. But that's the advantage, but only yeah. on, that, on the third octave. On the first two octaves, put it, removing your pinky doesn't ha have an advantage. I oh, might maybe do you're confusing with the the index. Yeah, the I'm index finger. That's for the D and D and D sharp. But mm -hmm. um, for the E, the only reason I would remove it is if I have to do an E and then I have to do a low C or a low C sharp mm -hmm. right after. Sometimes I'll play without the pinky so I can put it back yeah. faster. Some people they use the pinky as a stabilizer, stabilize and a stabilizing part. I think that's the reason, sort of, why it was introduced for the hand for there for stabilization. But you don't necessarily need it if you don't if your stabilization is good. If your hand's good, you don't necessarily. It doesn't yeah. change much. No. Yeah. Nope. So hopefully that answers your question. What do we got here? A lot of people say I should go. To, oh, so a lot of people say I should go. Oh, I should do daga, but when I start swinging it, uh, uh, I try double tonguing and stop it. Oh, okay. So a lot of people say I should do daga, but I start swinging it. And when I try double tonguing it softly, oh, I don't know what that that last sentence know, makes no know. sense, but it's okay. Uh, yeah, I don't understand that. <laughs> I start swinging it when I try double tonguing it softly. Right. So swinging yeah. means like dug. Yeah, dug, 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 Yeah, there we go. Yeah, that's probably it. Yeah. When you go faster, it does that? I guess so. I guess when you speed up rather than slowing down. Well, like, if you, you go very down. fast, you won't be able to go. Da -ga -da -ga -da -ga -da. At one yeah, point, it's going to stabilize. Yeah, it's not going to swing anymore. Just be aware, practice it <laughs> slowly, and then da -ga, right. da -ga. And you can practice without a flute. Da -ga, 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 da you know, and also practice it backwards. Sometimes it's just that one of them is too strong. Uh, in comparison to the other, so maybe practice it gada 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 and it will, it might put it back in in place mm -hmm. by starting with ga. Starting with ga, yeah. Uh, so but you, you shouldn't yeah. use daga <laughs> all the time. They're for different purposes, you know. Mm -hmm. If you want something more sharp, if you want something more. You know, uh, an, an articulation that's a bit more legato. If you want, right. it depends on what you what you want to play. Mm -hmm. Those are just different colors on your on your palette. Mm -hmm. But doesn't mean because you like the yellow, you should never use the blue. You know, it's uh, yeah. Uh, Silverfoot wants to know when playing piccolo with a band or orchestra, how do you mean to maintain? balance and the high notes and just make sure that you're not too loud you can ask the conductor if you're too loud because we're very close from our instrument we might think we're too loud but maybe the conductor thinks we're fine maybe he needs, maybe he's like i need more piccolo maybe he does need more you know you can just check with with the conductor because the conductor really his job or her job is to a bit like a painter you know he has the he, he has a step back from the from the painting and he can look 
and see what's what's missing and what's too much and say a little bit less of this a little bit more of that that's is the outside ears mm -hmm, really mm -hmm. that's his job to know mm -hmm. so i would do that i would just ask mm -hmm. or ask people in the in the hall yeah and then with time when you get the when you get the retroaction of that you'll you'll be able to adjust and at one point you'll know Mm -hmm. what is too loud what is what is fine what is, what fine. is not loud enough because you'll right. have the retroaction of no that's fine you know mm -hmm. i think that's how i would do it mm. you have a um yeah. no thanks nobody will Maybe kind of. okay yeah <laughs> for those people who are just listening audio wise <laughs> something's on my nose um Emily wants, or Robert Cowles wants to know, can you give us an example of how you would direct your students to perform long tones? Depends on my student. You don't want to play your flute? <laughs> no, I because don't. there's no point. You know, it's really, I look at my I student, sure. and then I try to figure out what's what's going on there what's making it difficult for them if they're what sometimes are some ways? it's all good you know yeah. um and then usually i try to ask them questions to know w how they um perceive things so recently i had a student a new student and i asked i th i saw he was making a lot of movements between different octaves and working very hard so i asked what's uh how do you uh, play different octaves? And he started to m explain very complicated things he was doing between each one of them, each register. And I said, okay. And I said, you know, it, it's a bit, it's a bit complicated. All that. What's your favorite register on your flute? And then he said, the low register. I said, well, that's where I think you're right. Mm -hmm. That's your best register, and that's the simplest when you explained it to me and I think you should apply that to all of them right. but another student would um, was a bit uh, more beginner and he was just pushing his lips forward and doing something with his nose like being mm -hmm. nervous every time he reached certain notes so I practiced different ways with him gave him other exercises doing octaves uh, going from a low note to a higher note without moving anything, trying to stay relaxed because the the movement in his face was not the problem. It was a symptom of of the stress he had about the high notes, you know. So we worked on that psychological aspect of staying calm and trusting his body that it can do it because the stress was what was making the movement that was coming in in conflict with a good sound, you know. Mm-hmm. I don't have one way. I look at the person. It's as if you said to a doctor, uh, how do you heal everyone? You know, mm -hmm. well, you look at the patient, you look, you listen, you try to find what's good for that person. But what I see a lot is people move too much, like people overwork. It's as if we think it can't be that simple. If I want a good sound, I have to work hard because we're taught since we're little kids, you want to succeed in life you have to work hard you have to work hard and we get all mixed up in that working hard thing and we over think things and we overwork and we i yeah sometimes because i see a lot of big movements going on that are detrimental to the sound mm. more than the opposite you know there are little movements but I don't think anyone's brain can really control each individual little movements that we do. We have to s make things simpler for us and let our body, trust our body that it can do uh, its thing. Mm. Very interesting. But yeah, and you know, you might get bored with uh, doing long tones all the time the same way. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when a student is a bit more advanced, I'll start to use long tones to develop uh, dynamics. So I'll do, um, I'll do like this. Yeah. German Haynes, uh, German, he says he uses long tones not much for sound, but for embouchure work 
Working on articulation forces me to focus on my airstream. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. If you so don't have yeah. air, you don't have the mm -hmm. tongue is not is not chopping anything. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can use long tones uh, to develop the dynamics like this. Mm -hmm. And you can practice it with vibrato, without mm -hmm. vibrato, you know, change things mm -hmm. around. Uh, yeah, so hopefully that helps. Uh, Silver Flute, he wants to know, or she wants to know, how do you prevent air leaks in your flute? Yeah, well, air leaks can happen, you mean just leaks probably, because air leaks are kind of like you accidentally miss your hole when you touch the key. Like leaks, leaks, or leaks from the pad, but you can call it air leaks too. Uh, how to prevent them? Uh, eventually pads degrade if you have regular pads and so do synthetic pads and synthetic pads also not the pads themselves but this stuff holding it goes away it just basically means that the pad is now not flat anymore so it's now imperfect somewhere you know so it causes that leak causes the air to go in and then causes uh, the thing and what a lot of flutes do to supplement that is by pressing harder which isn't good because you're introducing a lot of uh, pressure on this fine metal, usually silver, and silver can bend <laughs> more than or more than other metals. Gold can bend a lot as well too. Bend connection. I think gold bends even more easily. So you don't want to press. What you want to do is go and take it to a shop. But to prevent and make your pads last longer, uh, having lighter technique does has proven to have people's flutes last longer. Uh, pressing harder too. Uh, from what people have been saying to me also prevents it go longer too for some reason people who have hard pressing the pads tend to stay flat but then the mechanism suffers instead okay so but yeah also lighter you have touch to make sure you don't um, fluids let's say your flute has water in it you don't you make sure it's the the keys are always on top yes so you don't have water going in yeah but there's also tricks that a lot of people have been doing since uh, since the 1800s even with wooden flutes especially with wooden flutes and this is a trick that not many people talk about, but people, and I don't advise you to do it, but people do do it, but don't, uh, it's not me saying you should do it. A lot of people, they take almond oil or any type of oil and they take one drip and they put it, they take out the head joint and they drip it so that it goes directly down this tube here where there's no keys and then it stays there. And this is what they used to do with wooden flutes as well. And when you play, all that liquid that you make, all the condensation, goes down that root and doesn't go on your pads, doesn't go anywhere. Oh. So it actually stops from moisture getting to those pads and never gets there. It, in fact, drips out super fast out of the flute. I didn't know that. Yeah. It's a little trick that people do. And people used to do that with wooden ones because with wooden flutes, yeah. it would crack so yeah. even more. So like I said, also just specific types of fluids you know sugary drinks bring it to a, bring the, it to a shop like we said before like every year to make sure everything's fine right exactly because the problem is that the flute doesn't degrade like in one day it's something it does degrade gra over day it gradually it gradually degrades over over each day yeah but i mean yeah. it's it's yeah. not one day it's amazing and one day it's terrible no no it gradually so gets worse yeah we we get used to our flute yep exactly because it's so gradual yeah that we get used to it and then we can still play and sound yeah. quite okay on it yeah. but then maybe now we're we're making problems with the mechanism or other right. things so you you shouldn't wait for nope. your flute to sound bad to go yeah, the and moment, have it checked because yeah. maybe it does sound bad but you're not aware because yeah. you're compensating yeah. in, in certain ways i would say the moment you're aware that something could be wrong even if it's just a slight hesitation go and bring it to the shop they'll look at it they usually do free estimates before they do anything they can check it so do that because um your flute will constantly degrade <laughs> you know at the point of it being fully repaired it's going to start degrading again because of how you play because of oxidization because of all types of different things so yeah um yeah those are just some preventative tips don't press too hard because that just introduces way more problems than just the pads so and more expensive replacements so because remember it's all it's it's made out of precious metals that are like jewelry you know 
same virtually some of those pat some of those keys have the exact same thickness or even thinner thicknesses than than your than your jewelry so <laughs> if you break your jewelry you're gonna you know it's uh and there's many different mechanisms that are that are rubbing against each other all the time so that's introducing constant loss you know mm -hmm. and it's going to introduce more and more problems that way so yeah uh but that was a, the one i remember learning that trick and it was a it's a very interesting trick but you got to be very confident and and it works uh works surprisingly well what else is here pass plug in preventing ear leaks uh keep okay what percentage oh what percentage of uh, robert Coles again he wants to know what percentage of my practice time should be spent on long tones I'll, I, uh, me, I say five, ten minutes. Five, ten minutes for me. That's me, but that everyone's different. Five, ten minutes sometimes. When I was, even when I was doing it, doing it, like actually practicing more and more, it would be that much for me. You? I don't know. I four years I did like thirty minutes of sound exercises. That's but, different. Yeah. But not just um, long tones. Yeah. I had different ones I would change and use uh, de la sonorité. I liked it. So there was all the breathing part as well that I would put in there the nope. um, yeah. but I think it was too much I think I was kind of losing my time because my teacher was saying 30 minutes of this 30 minutes of that and she was very <sighs> I think I could have worked on other stuff but it was probably good because I, I focused so much on my sound my embouchure and everything now I can take my flute and uh, sound good right away uh -huh. when you know before I had good days and bad days and now yeah if i just some of course i'll i'll do all my all the notes on my flute and then i'll start playing but it takes two minutes and then i'm i'm good to go but mm -hmm. i still do exercises sometimes because sometimes i want to really focus on one thing yeah but i don't mm -hmm. know it it depends depends on your level what are your strengths and your weaknesses and also you don't want to let's say you're really working hard maybe you're gonna be very tired after 10 minutes mm -hmm. of that if you're really doing it with a lot of attention so mm -hmm. you shouldn't do more than five minutes mm -hmm, 10 minutes mm -hmm, and then go mm -hmm. to something else mm -hmm. it's difficult yeah. to answer those things yeah it is uh silver flute i just want to go back to silver flute because they were kind of talking in the chat about that that uh i'll just tell you that um what from what i'm reading here um it's that it's not the pads at all. It's probably something to do with the mechanism and not even the screw. Because some of the people, they they were saying like, oh, I can just fix it by turning a screw. Don't turn screws on your flute. If you have no idea what the hell you're doing, <laughs> sorry, what you're doing, don't do it. Go and learn, then do it. Because turning those screws changes not just one thing, but something else on the flute. And then you're introducing huge problems and bending keys big time. That's just the reality of it. Go to so a go shop. So go to a shop. Even the shop might not be, like from what I was reading, it sounds like that shop might not be looking at all the problems and they're just focusing on one place and they should be focusing on the whole flute to be able to find out where the where the full extent of the damage is because it sounds like the cup is actually now bent over and not, um, not the actual pad itself. The pad and the shims all can be fine, but if the, if the if the key has been bent so much that it's now wobbling inside the rod, then you're you can shim as much as you want. It's always going to leak. So that's my professional experience from Is that because I know that I've seen that a hundred thousand times. It could be inside here. It could be right here because it's the F. So it's like yeah. if you see right here with this F, the F key here. There's a lot of yep, things sharp. that can go wrong because there's two screws here beside between the E and the F that introduce all types of mechanisms here moves a lot of different keys it moves this key here and then this key moves this key here you know how how yeah. how intricate this little system is here to make that work but if you move only one of those screws you're introducing huge amounts of problems um friction and all types of different things so go and bring it to a tech because now They're you're introducing technician. yeah because now you're introducing yeah. a whole buttload of problems so yeah that's the complexity of those things I, I really advise that you learn, go and learn what those screws can do, then do it, but don't yeah, just get a screwdriver and then practice on your own flute because you're going to be paying huge bills to get those things replaced. And sometimes when it's too too far gone, it's oh, yeah. more it's, expensive to repair than to buy that's a right. new and one. That's right, and, and more times than not, it actually comes to that. Mm -hmm. So really, you are in that majority, so I would not... I know a lot of flutists that had little had screws, had those little, either bought the computer, you know, a little computer screw, 
or they bought the actual one for flute for oh, repairing. The screwdriver. Yeah, the screwdriver. Yeah. Go and learn how to do it first before buying it. If you really think that you can, if you have that desire to know how your flute works, go. You know, Landel Flutes does stuff. There's a bunch of go into apprentice with a with a, a repair technician at, in your local town. I'm sure they would be glad to help you out for something. You know, and uh, but don't do it unknowingly that oh it's just a screw and if I turn it that's actually not going to be the solution nine times out of ten because there are so many other things that going you're on. not aware of yeah they're going on that you're probably yeah. damaging yeah because yeah. it's crazy how many times uh, I've seen that okay just wanted to clear that up because there was a huge amount of chat about that so I wanted to make sure um, yeah you can repair your flute yourself and you need uh, somebody uh, Kitty Paw says you can repair the flute yourself but you need a special kit the you kit's not enough. Knowledge. The kit is literally not enough. <laughs> the kit, yeah. you're missing out on 99% of what else you need. The 1% is that kit. And then the other 99% is, is trying on trying that on hundreds of flutes or going and learning from somebody and trying it on a couple hundred, you know, a couple flutes, you know? Yeah, yeah. And being able to fix that because if you can't, you got to go and learn the, those things. A kit does not solve the problem. In fact, it'll probably make more problems in the long run. Because when you bring it to a technician, eventually after 10 years, when you've been self-repairing, you can have huge issues and they might not even be able to repair the flute or they have to remove material, which is also very bad. Yeah. Uh, can you, uh, Herman wants to know, could you say a little bit about the differences between French tonguing and the other ta? Tonguing, yeah. I guess. I guess. It's not clear to me what French tonguing is. <laughs> it's a more direct tongue. It's a more direct and what more I spitting laid, I thought. What I mean is uh, that, that tonguing between the lips, like the... Maybe. The rice you know? tonguing a little bit. Yeah. yeah. And I'm not very good at that one. Uh, and I don't like to use it so much. I use it sometimes when I want something more percussive. And I have time to tongue. Because the tongue is going further, so... It takes more time, mm -hmm. you know. But what I realized, because I had years where I was not even able to do it, and then I realized it's not when you bring the tongue forward that uh, it's happening. It's when you release the tongue that the sound happens. So now, okay, you're in my way a little bit. Sorry. You do it like this. <laughs> Focus on releasing. Yeah, yeah, totally. And mm -hmm. yeah, so yeah. that's it. It's really mm -hmm. between the the lips. So yeah. Mm. Yeah. I, but I never even see that. The, the even Rampo not many I, people yeah, talk yeah, like that. Yeah, so yeah, I don't know I've what seen, that thing is. That and is. maybe that's not. I, it, I went yeah, in France and know. my teacher studied in France. Right. And brought that knowledge over here. They sure. never told me about the French tonguing. Right. I only heard about the French tonguing when I went in the United States. Ah, well, that can be a whole entire different so thing. I'm <laughs> confused, you know, because <laughs> one of my... Yeah, tonguing between the lips, that's what Herman yeah, says. Okay. Yeah, okay. Because that's Thanks, very Herman. funny, because one of my teachers studied with Rampal, another one with Larieux, and uh, with uh, Marion, and all those guys, you know, and, and Raymond Guillot. They're the people my teachers studied with. Mm -hmm. And yes, they told me about the tonguing between the lips, mm -hmm. but it's not like they told me to tongue like that all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, mm. and they never told me about the French style of tonguing, but maybe it's because, you know, like in uh, in France, you don't call it French fries, French fries, or uh, Danish in, in, uh, in Denmark are called pastries mm -hmm. maybe that's why you know mm -hmm. maybe because i was like maybe What's maybe that maybe, French maybe. I, for a yeah. while I, I wasn't sure but mm. yeah i think it's just another tool when you want to tongue that way mm -hmm. you can use it but you it's not uh, the only way but no. yeah yeah. That's a way. That's but a you way. have to make sure it's very solid here when you do that. Because mm -hmm. there's a lot, of, it's very in front and it can disturb your embouchure. So your totally. embouchure has to be very stable. And then, mm -hmm. and it's not really the, what changed it all for me. It's, I used to think it's when I my tongue was hitting. That sure. 
that was important. That was important. No, it's when the tongue moves out of the way that mm -hmm. it's important. Yeah, when okay. I understood that, then I was able to do it. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Okay. Yeah, and it's interesting because also some, you don't, we don't tell, but you can also play without tonguing sometimes. Mm-hmm. You, sure. you can, if you have a high totally note can. that's, that's uh, piano mm -hmm. and uh, you want to. And it sounds like it starts from nothing mm -hmm. or at the beginning of the um, Doppler, you know, the. If you start with no tongue, it's interesting. No teacher ever told me that, but then you There's listen to recordings. Yeah. And uh, yeah, one of my teacher told me that. But, you know, we, we don't talk about that that much, but like Marion, I've been listening to him mm -hmm. a little bit. He does that sometimes. Mm -hmm. No tongue, just... And it's so beautiful because it seems like it's starting from nothing. Mm -hmm. There's many different ways. Yeah. Another way ways. is the P. Do you ever use P? It depends. Like There's when you want to do very soft and... There's different effects for it. That's a mm -hmm. nice one too. It's a bit yeah. different, but... Mm -hmm. So there's... You know, there's peu, but peu, you wouldn't... It's just for the first note. Yes. You don't do peu between then two peu notes. Peu. No, you don't do peu peu. You just yeah. do one peu. peu, peu, peu. That's <laughs> it. Just one peu. Yeah. You, yeah. you close your lips and you open... You have the air ready and you release mm -hmm. it's just when you have a soft note a bit like the no tongue but mm -hmm. i prefer the no tongue than the per personally mm -hmm. but some people it they make it very beautiful mm. and then you have like behind the teeth the t -t -t, like at the junction of the teeth and mm. the, mm. yeah but yeah the it's efficient mm. Mm. but i think it's slower for me it's slower but i've seen people do it very fast that's when you have to respect, like, we're all a bit different. Then you yeah. find what sounds good for you and mm -hmm. you go in that direction. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, going back to the repairing stuff, there are some things that you can do. Like if a spring pops, you can fix that, but you got to be very careful with the springs. When a spring pops out, you got to put no pressure and, like, lightly bring it back up to the screw and not just pull and then bring it to the screw because now you've re you've retensified that that spring now so now it's going to react way differently to all the other springs in your hand so you're going to have different technique and then you're going to introduce problems in your hand and get pain and uh cleaning the flute don't use any abrasives if you're doing cosmetic things like there's grime and stuff yeah like somebody mentioned using uh, rubbing candle wax and stuff like that like paraffin on it it'll get rid of it it sort of works it works but i mean cosmetic things don't use any abrasives because it's uh, you're breathing in that stuff when you put it on there. You're also putting it on your fingers, no matter how you know. And, and you're breathing in, your in skin, gets on. Huh? It actually absorbs in your skin the super skin fast. It absorbs everything. Yeah. So, um, well, not everything, but but yeah. Enough. So <laughs> cosmetic things, sure, there are some things that can be done, but like really, don't touch screws, don't touch pads, don't touch those it's other a bit, things. It's a bit tricky to yeah. do that. Yeah. And uh, get a junk flute and take it apart. Buy a flute for ninety nine dollars from Amazon, and and rip it apart and try doing stuff with that. Yeah, but don't, but do don't it on take your, your good flute. Understand yeah. how it goes, but that only teaches you only so much too. So really, it's, it's better about to go take a real go and take a real thing. Course, so yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah. Um, so you guys have any more questions? We'll answer two or three more questions. If you guys have any more, we'll answer them. Um, in the meantime, while you guys think of some questions, uh, Emily also has, and we have a, well, the studio is out. You're having, teaching some lessons online now. So, yeah, I uh, love it. You love it. We love it. And I'm sure you guys will love it too. I wasn't sure in the beginning about teaching on Skype because you can't touch. On Skype or FaceTime, yeah, any of those things. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because, yeah, you can't, you can't touch, touch yeah. that person and be like, right. but it's very fun because you really see well on the... Uh, yeah. You, you can know, see, yeah, I can see pretty well now. The resolution's well. great now, and yeah. And usually, when I teach, I'm not necessarily face to face, so I think I miss things. It's gonna even change the way I teach in person. Yeah, sure. Because when we're next to each other, there's in that angle, I don't see everything either. You know, mm -hmm. so it's interesting. I like it. I think it's efficient, and 
yeah, as long as people put enough light and I can see them, then uh, and I can hear them well, it's all yeah, good, you know. Exactly, exactly. And uh, uh, yeah, so you can fun. yeah you can email us at info at the flute channel dot com. So info at the flute channel dot com, and we can let you know uh, what uh, what's available for you. Uh, yeah, and that's really much it for that. And um, then we have the festival coming up. So next week we're probably not going to have uh, just practicing or a flute talk podcast for the weekend so uh we're gonna have a lot of footage from the festival gonna be slowly coming out the week after very quickly uh the festival will also be available for people to download the actual three days worth of lessons and master in your group lesson morning master classes we're gonna have that as a little package thing uh in about two weeks that people can you know you didn't miss out you can go and uh we're gonna watch sell that. it we're gonna sell for, uh... for i think like 15 or 20 bucks for the what is it six nine twelve you know 18 hours worth of of uh, of lessons and group stuff that we're going to try to s- try to segment a bit better for everybody also the concert will be out uh, for free on 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 the, on the channel as well that we're going to put out where you and alexa will be playing and uh, yeah and then um that's about it i think is also oh, as victor is asking is there a book coming soon yes the book is coming soon we're just like finishing it and it's going to be out in digital and in a, a hard version as well. And it's plus, we have other books. I mean, yeah, it's just, it's the, just like um, the. Well, we don't need to. It's it's coming. The editing <laughs> part is, yeah. is in the finishing, but yeah. it's all it's all conceptually com- done. Yeah. It's just like we're just putting it together, yeah, we putting were it together. Thinking and stuff. about we're gonna make a couple of new things. Yeah, yeah some we cool little books for people. For yeah, that's gonna be really cool, and we're gonna be slowly transitioning out of. Uh, our um, merch store that we have right now we're going to be going to Teespring which a lot of Americans I think know about as well and it's worldwide too but uh, Teespring they're very good so we're going to go with them with some of our new merch that we're going to have out soon some cool stuff that I think everyone's going to really enjoy uh, getting from us yes and the book and everything so yeah um, what else do we have here how much experience oh now for the festival how much experience do you need to be accepted or is it any experience for the flute festival, it can be anyone, and you can come as a elementary school flutist, a high school flutist, you know, any any age group. And you could be starting older, adult. adult uh, it doesn't yeah. matter. It's for everybody. It's it's really the morning classes are this real like, you know, uh, melting pot. Well, some people decide not to play. Right, which and is totally it's fine. fine. Mo- but last first year we had people that decided not to play on the first day, and then on the second day they brought yeah, their flute. Yeah, that can happen. But, uh, yeah. Because they realize the morning class is really, um, it's a bit like this, you know. Yeah, in it's a way. exactly like this, pretty much. Yeah. I, except more I flute s- sounds. Usually, sometimes. I s- yeah, we play more, but <laughs> I start by asking what people would like to work on, and then we work on that. And I bring exercises that we can all do together, and uh, that's pretty much what we did last year. Exactly. And then when there was more time, I said, "Anyone want to play a study or a piece or anything that we could work on?" And we did that. And in the afternoon, it's a real master class with a pianist and yeah. Alexa still teaches. Which is like, even if you're a high schooler and, or somebody oh, who just, start, just somebody who's starting the flute, you're going to hear what the level of flute is, you know? You get to hear what the what this high level is, you know? Yeah. It's really quite awesome, to be honest. I, I, but I there's came different out of it. levels I know. as well. Like, there's people that are very advanced that play for her. There's people But you get to advanced. hear her play too, though, you so that helps. Her, so, yeah. You get to hear her, yeah. her, 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 um... You know what she says to those people to help them, her, her um, mm-hmm. counsel, you know, right, her, right, right. and um, you get to listen to different pieces. Maybe you don't know the flute repertoire that much, you'll yeah. learn more. You know, I, I always said those courses were good for all mm-hmm, of that, mm-hmm, you know, getting mm-hmm. to know your instrument better, different mm-hmm. sounds, different. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What piece did you just play to demonstrate? I just think now. I played the Doppler uh, Hungarian uh, fantasy. Yeah Doppler, yeah. yeah, Doppler fantasy, the Hungarian fantasy yeah. for solo flute or flute for flute piano. piano or flute and orchestra. Yeah, you also played a little bit of Chandelinos before that too. Yeah, I played a little bit of Chandelinos. Um, yeah, what is the best company for beginner flutes? There's a couple. There's a couple of them. We don't in any way are sponsored by any of them, but uh, Yamaha, Trevor James, Sonari is good. Good mind hearts, good. To, you know, you gotta try all types of flutes. That's our thing. We have a, a thing with the Flute Center of New York, which has the most, the largest selection of flutes in the whole world. Uh, you can go to their website, flutesforsale, the number four dot com. So flutesforsale dot com, and you can use our code TFC, 
You can it, try up to if you use three or four our flutes, code yeah. TFC. It, it it helps us when you when you buy the flute, and of also course. it gives you uh, you can try more flutes for longer, and you have a longer warranty. So yeah, it's all in the description. Yeah, so yeah, get to try the flutes for ten days, and you can you can pick your flutes. So you pick your flutes, and you get to try them. But the point is, is that you should try as many flutes of different brands as you can, or maybe some of the same type of flute brand of flute, but different models, so you can really see whether or not the flute fits for you. Because well, you have to make sure you try the flute before you buy it. I think. Oh, you know? that's what you have to do. So you have to try them before you buy them. Exactly. No, but it's because sometimes if you buy online, you don't necessarily have that luxury. But with them, you. But do. that's the luxury with this. So is what I'm saying. That's with why. Flutes, that's why I mentioned so it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So. You can try it up for 10 days. You can even just call them and talk to them. They're all flutists there. The whole office is full of flutists. Uh, just tell them that we sent you and they'll take care of you. And, and there's been a lot of people who have bought flutes for, uh, from us, from our, from, our, from our videos, from our... our uh, yeah, they bought from flutes our, from them uh, using our advice. Post. Yeah, and our yep. advice. And so, yeah, you can definitely check that out. And um, But yeah, there's a lot of good, good flutes. Trevor James makes good flutes. Yamaha makes good flutes. They all make good flutes. A lot of good flute makers now. Like the standard flute that people make now, 150 years ago, <laughs> would have been amazing 150 years ago. You know what I mean? So it's really advanced a lot as well. Um, we'll do one final question. And you guys have been so great today. Thanks so much for taking part of the taking part of it. Um, Remix wants to know what is your favorite type of music for flute. <laughs> My favorite type of music, music for, for the flute. I don't know. I like a lot of different types. <laughs> different types, yeah. Well, yeah. I like I like the. I think I like the twentieth century a lot. Yeah, twentieth century. There's music. a lot of because for flute there's a lot of stuff there and it's really written for this flute. Uh mm -hmm. Because the baroque music was written for another type of flute, really. That also needed less air than this flute, mm -hmm. so sometimes it's more of a, you know, it's a bit different. Right. But like Debussy, Nielsen, all those composers, they wrote for this modern mm -hmm. flute, and there's beautiful music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think a little bit of 20th century, a little bit of romantic music is really good too. We don't have that much romantic music, though. That's but it's good. But <laughs> anything that's not romantic music is good. I know, like Reineke and yeah, all that. It's so beautiful. I'm, yeah. It's just I wish we had more because I love romantic music. Uh -huh. Like on the piano, I love playing Chopin. A lot of flutists. Yeah, a lot of flutists. Can, <laughs> a big a lot of Chopin flutists, yeah, fan. A lot, yeah, a lot of flutists uh, tend to rearrange Brahms and, and Chopin a lot. So Chopin has beautiful melodies, so it's, yeah, it's, it's easy true. to... Yeah, uh, it's true. It's true. Exactly. So, yeah. Um... So look out for all those new videos that we're going to have in the future from the festival. Plus, we have some new videos, including some music videos. And we're going to do some more Tom Play stuff as well. Um, check out all those videos from Just Practicing. We have a couple new ones in the Just Practicing series. Plus, we have loads of videos, 130 or 140 videos of other music if you're not or videos and if you're not familiar with us go and check out the backlog uh of all the playlists and all those things like that and uh, that really does help us out as well just watching our videos and asking us questions and yeah all those things you know yeah that's it i think and then yeah be sure to uh be in touch with us on our community page on youtube if you haven't subscribed please subscribe like this video uh after you watch this and leave a question or a comment down in the description below the description for us that also helps us out a lot and i think now it's open out to everybody so you can comment there as well including the chat so yeah um thanks guys all your questions were so awesome and we'll be sure to be back in uh, about two weeks two weeks we'll be back for another flute talk or two and a half or two or three weeks but we'll do a just practicing in two weeks uh, just practicing in two weeks and then in three weeks we'll do a flute talk podcast again thanks everybody so thanks. much for watching Really appreciate it. See ya. Bye.